Hello and welcome to this installment of the Martial Opera Oral History Project. My name is Monica Nimi and I am an operatic soprano based in New York. And today I have the very distinct pleasure of speaking with American composer and conductor Louis Karchin. Hailed as a composer of fearless eloquence, Louis Karchin has been honored with performances of his music throughout the United States, Europe, and the Far East. He has been championed by such organizations as the Chamber Music Society of Lincoln Center, the Fort Worth Opera, the Center for Contemporary Opera, Tanglewood, the Guggenheim Museum, the Louisville Orchestra, the Group for Contemporary Music, the DeCapo Chamber Players, the New York New Music Ensemble, and many more. His music is recorded on Bridge, Noxos, New World, Albany, and CRI labels, and his compositions are published by C.F. Peters Corporation and the American Composers Alliance. Mr. Karchin is the recipient of numerous awards for his work, including Kusevitsky, Frum, and Barlow Foundation commissions, a Guggenheim Fellowship, and three awards from the American Academy of Arts and Letters. Active as a conductor, he has founded or co-founded noted performing ensembles, including the Harvard Group for New Music, the Chamber Players of the League ISCM, the Washington Square Ensemble, and most recently, the Orchestra of the League of Composers. He is professor of music at New York University. Welcome, Lou. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you so much for organizing this. To begin with, um, as I see on so many of these interviews, we want to find out where your urge to write music came from. And I think that stems back to your childhood and what you were exposed to at a young age. Would you describe your musical background growing up? Sure. Um, I did start both playing piano and composing at a very early age. I started taking piano lessons probably around age five and a half. And I started writing down small tunes around the same time. Uh, both activities seemed like two sides of the same coin. It was very natural to play and also write down music. So I never questioned um, whether uh, I should do one or the other. I just always thought it was natural to do both. and. Um, all through school, through elementary school, through junior high school, through high school, I had really wonderful mentors, wonderful teachers. Uh, I think I was lucky in that regard. Uh, in junior high school, um, the orchestra director, Joseph Simon, was very encouraging. He gave me an opportunity to perform with the school orchestra, to write a piece for the school orchestra, even in junior high school. And in high school, largely the same thing. Uh, the music director there, Henry Perlberg, uh, gave me similar opportunities. And also, there was a program which I believe may have been initiated by the Ford Foundation. It may have been a national program to bring composers into the Philadelphia schools uh, where I was studying and uh, to seek out creative talent. And the head of um, a school called the Philadelphia Musical Academy, now part of the University of the Arts, uh, Joseph Castaldo, came into Northeast High School where I was studying and uh, eventually gave me private lessons in composition. And this was a way to learn exactly what was going on right at the moment and what had happened during the 20th century uh, with composing and creativity and music. How wonderful that those opportunities presented themselves and also that I, I imagine your parents were, were very supportive of your endeavors. <laughs> Uh, they certainly were. They were not professional musicians themselves. Uh, they were school teachers. They were both quite aware of the arts. Uh, they both thought the arts were extremely important. My father was an amateur violinist. So there was generally an awareness um, of what I was doing musically and also a lot of encouragement, uh, which you can't really take for granted. Indeed not. Um, from personal experience, I, I understand that as well. Um, 
How many how many instruments do you play? By the way, it seems like well, an orchestra, <laughs> piano. Um, the only one that I play with any proficiency is piano, but. Uh, again, growing up, I had the opportunity to learn violin, and then I took up viola as an extension of that when there weren't enough people to play viola in the high school orchestra. And uh, then so I could play in the marching band, I played baritone sax for a while, but that was instructive. I learned a lot about woodwind instruments. Uh, I may have even played clarinet for a little while, but I'm not sure about that. <laughs> Were you at the time realizing that this knowledge would help your composition career or did the instruments come first? I, I'm sure I realized that because I was already orchestrating things. I wrote a piece for my high school orchestra called Three Pieces for Orchestra. Uh, I conducted it with the orchestra. So I had to have some working knowledge of the instruments. And I imagine we, we didn't have the the kind of computer technology that we do today. So this was all orchestrating by hand? This was all handwritten. But remember, composers have been doing that for centuries. <laughs> it's hard to believe, but we haven't always had computers. <laughs> this is why I stick to singing and I let the composers do the hard work. <laughs> <laughs> so um, you're, you're, you're through high school and then you decide to, to make a, a go of it in, at university and you went to Eastman? Uh, that's right. So my first um, post high school school was the Eastman School of Music. And at this point, I was rather sure that music was going to be my career. And I had the opportunity there to study both piano and composition seriously. And the wonderful thing about Eastman was simply that there were so many very high level performers around and many of them were quite willing to take on new music to experiment with what composers were doing and there was generally a very nice atmosphere of collaboration i think that has always been one of the characteristics of eastman and um, from my visits back there i think it's still true to this day um, also, I met one of my primary mentors there, the composer Samuel Adler, who was very instrumental in helping me both at Eastman and later. And we've been in touch constantly throughout both of our careers, as it turns out. And last year, I was happy to be able to meet him and go out to lunch with him uh, around the time of his 94th birthday. Uh, but he's still incredibly active and still composing and still traveling. Did you decide on Eastman based on, on his being there or were there other factors that contributed to your decision? It was partly based on his being there. Uh, I had interviewed with him uh, prior to my coming. Uh, there were a couple of other factors, one of which was geography. It wasn't so far from Philadelphia that um, uh, it would be a long trip for my parents, and I think that was very important to them. <laughs> I'm sure they, they, they delighted in getting to, to be close to you and to, to witness your growth as a composer. Sure. Um, and then after Eastman, you went to Harvard and you got not one but two degrees? Uh, yes. So I received uh, a master's degree and PhD in composition and theory at Harvard. And that was really a completely different atmosphere, but it was nice because it was complementary. And there were not so many performers around, although there were some very, very good ones. Uh, for example, Yo-Yo Ma was an undergraduate while I was a graduate student at Harvard. And uh, after a while, I got a job in one of the Harvard houses, uh, Courier House, which was on the Radcliffe Quad, but the two schools were integrated at that point. And so I lived in Courier House, and Yo-Yo was also a resident of Courier House. So I got to see him quite a bit, and uh, he and some colleagues of his were frequently performing chamber music, and that was incredible to hear at the time. I, I actually learned the, the traditional chamber music repertory that way. Uh, so it wasn't as if there were no performers at Harvard, uh, but also there was a lot of discussion about music, a lot of very deep discussion. And that was another side of the coin, which I think was very helpful to me. Well, and Harvard, um, 
geographically is, is somewhat close to Tanglewood, where you did, you were a fellow, a, comp a composition fellow there twice? Uh, that's correct. Actually, I was a composition fellow at Tanglewood at the end of my sophomore year at Eastman, and also at the end of my junior year, so two summers back to back. And Tanglewood really was an incredible experience, partly because of the saturation of music. Uh, you were able to hear the Boston Symphony perform every weekend, and you learned so much repertoire, so much repertoire that way. So it was fascinating on many, many levels. The two composers who were there the most during my stays were Gunther Schuller and Bruno Moderna. And they were very similar. They were similar in style, they were similar in aesthetics, and they were similar in the fact that they were both composer conductors. And this was very fascinating to me. And I think the fact that I've meshed those two activities in my own career may have had a lot to do with the early exposure to their influence. So is it safe to say that prior to Tanglewood, the thought of a dual career, so to speak, in both composition and conducting, had, had that really occurred to you? Or was that something that came up as a result of Tanglewood? Well, I'm not sure about the dual career aspect. I think conducting also seemed very natural to me. And also, it seemed a little bit more natural than performing on piano, which was very uncomfortable to me. I liked the piano as a tool for composing, uh, but I never really was comfortable performing on piano in public. Conducting, uh, somehow, I didn't seem to have that problem. I had no problem conducting concerts and not feeling nervous. And um, so I was actually more willing to take on conducting, particularly when I needed it to promote my own music. But then I also began becoming interested in promoting and helping along the music of colleagues too. Uh, I just found it interesting to conduct music of peers. Um, and so, I've done a fair amount of conducting over the years, but I've always thought about it as being an extension of composing, with composing being the primary activity. It seems incredibly logical when you when you explain it like that. Um, I, I'll get to your compositions momentarily, but I'm just curious, when was the first time that you conducted a piece that you had written? Well, that was probably the uh, three pieces for orchestra that I mentioned uh, just a while ago. Uh, that I conducted with my high school orchestra. Uh, but then I had uh, some opportunities to conduct at Eastman, to conduct some small ensembles. I had even more opportunity at Harvard because I became very interested in opera. I studied a lot of opera. And then with a close colleague of mine, uh, Paul Salerni, uh, again, this is someone whom I've been friends with pretty much throughout both of our careers, but we met at Harvard as graduate students and we decided to put on a production of an opera as graduate students at Harvard. And the opera that we picked was Mozart's Abduction from the Seraglio. So that was one of my first experiences conducting traditional music. Wow. So um, what? why abduction, just out of curiosity? I guess there were a number of reasons. Uh, part of it was simply it was something we thought, thought we could reasonably do with the forces and the budget um, and the performers at our disposal. Uh, we both loved Mozart. We were both studying the marriage of Figaro for uh, PhD qualifying exams that we had to pass. So Mozart was on our minds at the time. That makes sense. So um, after you, you, you have your doctorate, um, what was life like as a composer slash conductor out of school um, in terms sure. of writing? Uh, good question. Well, I did need a job and I was fortunate to get one in New York City, which was my choice of a place to live. And I had applied for a job at New York University. I was fortunate to be asked to join the faculty. and. The department 
uh, the department's programming composition was fledgling at the time. I was able to build it up over the years, I think. But it afforded me lots and lots of opportunity to get to work with New York performers. And I became involved with an organization called the League ISCM, uh, the ISCM standing for International Society for Contemporary Music. And this was the oldest organization in the United States devoted to the performance of new music. And after a few years with the organization, I became the president of the organization, then the chairman. And so I was responsible for a fairly extensive concert series. And I often conducted on concerts of the League ISCM. One of the first groups that I started in New York was, uh, along with uh, some, some colleagues, uh, the chamber players of the League ISCM when we codified our ensemble. So a lot of my experience conducting had to do with conducting small ensembles in music that was just written either by myself or by colleagues or by senior composers or by younger composers. Wow. So prior to forming the chamber ensemble and the orchestra, they had no in-house ensemble. Would that, would that be accurate, accurate to say? Well, there was always a uh, group of freelance players um, that performed on our concert, but this was a way of basically uh, defining the ensemble, uh, choosing players that would work with us concert after concert, and uh, simply solidifying the organization so that there would be some continuity to it, I think. It, it sounds like you met a vast array of um, fellow composers and musicians. Did any of those individuals, their instruments, did, did that influence what instruments you wrote for or what voices you wrote for? Or I guess to m more simply say, um, do you have a, an instrument or a voice type that you enjoy composing for more than others? Yes, one of the most common ensembles at the time and still now is something called a Piero ensemble, which is based around the instruments used in Schoenberg's work, Piero Lunaire. And so this would be an ensemble comprised of flute, clarinet, violin, cello, piano, and although Schoenberg did not add it, uh, often percussion is added to this group. And of course, Schoenberg added a soprano or speaker, uh, but often this is a purely instrumental ensemble as it's currently used. So I wrote a fair amount of music for this combination, as did my colleagues. Uh, these players were readily available to us. And the combination is a very bright and lively one. It's an inviting combination. So many of my pieces were for this group or for some subset of this group. But I very much started out with instrumental music. As I mentioned, uh, this was very much in my background. And I think instrumental music was at the forefront, uh, certainly during my 20s. And in my early 30s, I wrote a piece which did use a Piero ensemble, but with soprano. And it was called Songs of John Keats. And this work in particular seemed to get a great deal of recognition. It was performed by many ensembles across the United States. And all of a sudden, I became very interested in writing vocal music. I had written some of it before, but I had not focused on it. And this led to several more vocal instrumental ensembles. This eventually led to my first opera. And overall, I have written music for both instruments separately and instruments with voice or voice and piano more or less simultaneously. I don't think of myself either as an exclusively vocal or instrumental composer, but I have been immersed in both worlds quite a bit. And at the risk of venturing into um, forbidden territory, I understand your daughter is a soprano. Um, do you write for her 
her voice ever? Yeah, yes, I do. Uh, my daughter, Marissa, is currently in the doctoral uh, vocal performance program at Juilliard, and she's performed several works of mine. I've written several songs with her voice in mind, and uh, it's certainly very inspiring to have a soprano uh, right in my own home. <laughs> it must be very useful and, and a wonderful way to share music across the generation. It is, very much. So, um, I'd like to talk about your opera, Jane Eyre, since that is the work that um, I will be performing a piece from on our October 28th concert with Marshall Opera. Um, you described it in your liner notes of your CD as the largest project you had ever undertaken. Um, would you mind telling us a bit about <laughs> that project from, it, from inception to the stage? Sure. Well, it certainly was the largest project I've ever undertaken. It was well over two hours of music. It was for a full orchestra and 13 singers, very large cast. Some of those roles may be combined, uh, but 13 separate parts. There's also an optional children's chorus. So it really was a huge undertaking. The final score was over 700 pages long. Uh, the scores are very heavy. They're even heavy to carry around. So this opera uh, germinated and was composed over many years. I think the actual composition was accomplished over about four years, but it was preceded by a chamber opera, Romulus. And for anyone interested in taking something like this on as a composer, uh, I definitely recommend writing a smaller opera, writing a chamber opera first. I, I learned a great deal from doing that. And Romulus, my first opera, was performed in 2007 in a wonderful production uh, sponsored by the Guggenheim Museum at their Peter B. Lewis Theater, which is underneath the rotunda. And right after that, I started thinking about writing a full-length opera. I thought, okay, one project completed, let's go on to something bigger. And there was a friend of mine, actually a friend of our family's, uh, Diane Osen. Uh, our families, in fact, had gotten to know each other through our daughters. They had become very good friends at a very early age. And Diane uh, is a writer, and she was the person that I usually came to when I was setting poetry and I could not understand something. And so we already had this kind of working relationship. And I mentioned to her my idea about composing an opera, and she mentioned me a book that was very close to her that she always thought of, had thought about perhaps writing a libretto for, and that was Jane Eyre. And I thought about it, we talked about it for a little while, and finally I asked her to construct a scenario that I could look at and see if it was inspiring from a dramatic standpoint. And she came uh, out with this first incredible scene, this very dramatic scene where Jane is putting out a fire in the bedroom of Edward Rochester, the other protagonist of the opera. And this was something that occurred about a third way through the novel, but we both realized that this was a great place to start an opera, it would grab everyone's attention. And in any case, the first third of the novel would be very hard to represent on stage because this was about Jane's growing up. Uh, you would need to feature a child uh, singer for a very long period of time, it seemed very problematic. And then Diane found many other ways in which to represent various scenes from the novel very well. So in the end, I asked her to go ahead and write the libretto. I waited until the entire libretto was finished to compose the music, but then I just dove in. I did ask for quite a few changes, but as I mentioned over a period of years, uh, we were able to construct uh, the entire opera. Well, that sort of um, helps transition into a question that I, I wanted to ask, which was your 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 composition plan for the day. Like, how does 
when you sit down to work, do you have a specific set of a specific number of, of bars of music that you are going to write that day or else? Or is your process less structured? Well, there is a process that I undertake, although it was a little bit different for Jane Eyre, again, because of the length and also because there was an a libretto already there. And often you don't have the guidance of a text or a libretto when you're working. But first of all, I tend to think about what I'm going to write for a while without setting down notes on paper. And then when I do go to pencil and paper, which I usually do before computer, um, I usually make several drafts of each piece and each draft becomes more and more exact as I go along. I like to be able to see through to the end of the piece before I firm up all the details about the beginning of the piece. And I highly recommend this method to other composers as well. I've used it for many, many pieces. In the case of Jane Eyre, though, that really was not possible. It was simply too long to think ahead um, two hours later to what might affect the very opening of the piece. But I do think that I use that process for each act individually. So in other words, each act was written one at a time, but in each case, I knew pretty much what would happen in every place in the act before I set in stone too much of the music for any one place. I can't imagine what kind of an undertaking that would have been. I mean, you, you said it was over the course of four years. Um, are you willing to discuss some of the challenges of having a full length opera produced and conversely some of, of the joys involved? Sure. Uh, well, the production, of course, that was a whole separate issue from the composition of the opera. At first, I was really concerned mainly with the composition of the piece. And when we finished the first act, uh, I got together with some singers and a pianist, and we made a demo tape of the entire first act that in itself was about 45 minutes of music. And we sent it to several competitions, and I was delight delighted to see it win showcase berths uh, from the Center for Contemporary Opera and also from the Fort Worth Opera on their Frontier series. And in fact, it was performed first on the inaugural round of the Fort Worth Opera's Frontier series. Um, and then shortly after that, it was done by the Center for Contemporary Opera. And I kind of waited to see whether either lead would lead to a production of the opera. It did not in Fort Worth, but uh, it did with the Center for Contemporary Opera. And for that, I really do have to thank Jim Schaefer. He was very supportive of Jane Eyre from the very, very beginning. And he helped me enormously throughout this entire process. I think I helped him a little bit too. He was very collaborative, but we were able to uh, uh, managed to mount a full production of Jane Eyre at the K Playhouse at Hunter College in uh, 2016. You mentioned when we we spoke a few weeks ago that it's it's very challenging to find venues in New York City, um, given the size of the orchestra and and the logistics. That, that was actually a primary difficulty. We scouted many locations, and particularly in Manhattan there were very few locations possible that could accommodate an orchestra of that size in the pit. In fact, Hunter College was the only one that we found outside of Lincoln Center. Wow. You don't think of that being an issue in a city the size of New York, but I, I gather real estate is in high demand, so that would be a problem. Um, there, there, there are more performing arts uh, facilities now. There's the Perlman Center, there's the Shed. Maybe things have improved, but uh, at the time, that was really a great difficulty. Um, and you used the same primary singers for from the showcase through the actual full production and the recording, or did that change? Uh, no, we started over. I realized that every opera company 
really has its own mechanisms for choosing singers and for working out a production. And I did not really want to interfere with that. And uh, CCO, the Center for Contemporary Opera, had a wonderful casting director at the time, uh, Jenny Rivera, who was also a wonderful mezzo-soprano. And she really was the one who guided the casting of Jane Eyre. Uh, she helped us immeasurably. She seemed to know every single singer in the United States. And um, I think that that was a very important factor in, in getting together an incredible cast. With all these challenges and just the, the magnitude of putting on an opera that you've written, do you have any plans for a follow-up for a, another opera in the near future? <laughs> no specific ones at the moment, but it's something that I'd be very open to. I'd like more details to fall in place this time before I actually started writing the opera. It's very difficult to write an opera on spec, as it were. It's very scary. <laughs> and um, certainly under the right conditions, I'd be happy to write another one. Well, as a, an opera singer, I, I look forward to that eventuality. <laughs> Thank you. In the meantime, do you have any other compositional bucket list items? Um, I think you mentioned perhaps a, a concerto. That's right. There's a, a piano concerto in the works. There's a piece for string orchestra. Actually, a lot of instrumental music, a piece for violin and piano. So there are a number of projects I'm involved with at the moment. Uh, but it would certainly be uh, very nice to get back to vocal writing. And also one uh, very nice thing that came out of Jane Eyre was that I received a commission from the Fromm Foundation, uh, the Fromm Music Foundation, to write a piece for uh, the uh, lead soprano from Jane Eyre, uh, Jennifer Zetlin. And we premiered this piece last April with the Talia Ensemble here in New York. Uh, the piece is called Tribute to the Angels, and we're hoping to record it very soon. That's very exciting. Um, I know the past few years have not been kind to, to classical music and classical musicians, but it seems that you've managed to use that time to generate several works, um, and you have several upcoming concerts and releases, a CD, a, would you care to talk about any of that? Sure. Well, I've just had a release on Bridge Records, and this is music mostly that I did compose during the pandemic period, which, as you mentioned, was a very, very hard period, I think, uh, certainly for performing artists and also certainly for composers because performances for a while pretty much dried up. So. It was a period that was very stressful, I think, for everyone in the arts. And my solution to that, and I think for many of my colleagues, is that we wrote a lot of music for solo instruments. So on this release, uh, there are three works for piano. There's a solo organ piece. Uh, there's a solo clarinet piece. And there's also a woodwind quintet, uh, which again is a recent piece. And this was premiered by a very brave group, Windscape, right at the height of the Omicron scare. Uh, even up till the morning of the concert, they were debating whether they would have to wear a special type of woodwind mask while performing at the concert. And the Manhattan School of Music, uh, where they were giving the premiere, finally relented and said that they could perform the work, premiere the work without masks, as long as they took COVID tests that morning. But it was that kind of atmosphere in which it was premiered. And um, you have a concert coming up on October 15th. This will, of course, date our interview. But um, did you, it's a premiere of Incantations and Dances? Uh, that's correct. This is a piece that was written for a group that I've worked with extensively over the years, the De Capo Chamber Players. They've performed at least five of my compositions, probably more, I've, I've lost track. Uh, but they're doing uh, this new piece on Sunday. I've already heard some of the rehearsals. Uh, they perform it spectacularly well, so I'm very much looking forward to this. 
And we're almost at the end of the interview, but I just have a few more quick questions. Um, sure. For the individual who is just becoming familiar with your work and they want a playlist, um, what would you recommend that we listen to to give us a taste of, of your writing? Sure. Well, of course, uh, I would listen to the operas or excerpts from the operas. Uh, some of these are on my website. So certainly uh, listening to excerpts from Jane Eyre and Romulus is a good start. There's also a work for mine for chamber ensemble, baritone voice, and dancers, a mask called Orpheus, based on the Orpheus legend. And I often recommend this piece to people who want to get to know my music. Uh, not only can you hear the music, which they'll hopefully like, but there's also dancers to watch. Uh, this is also on my website. It's also on YouTube. Uh, there's, for purely instrumental music, I recommend my chamber symphony, which has been performed by quite a few groups. And um, I think those pieces are a pretty good start uh, as far as an inroad into my work. Lots of good listening. I've really enjoyed getting to know your music. Um, final question. To young composers today, any words of wisdom or encouragement? Well, it is a tough environment for the arts at the moment, I think, especially coming out of the pandemic. But I think there are waves. Um, sometimes, unexpectedly, times become terrific for the arts. And so there's a kind of ebb and flow for all of this. I think if you really want to write music, you really don't have a choice. If it's something that you must do, you become a composer and it more or less overwhelms everything else. And I do still encourage people, in spite of the challenges, to become composers. I think it's a wonderfully fulfilling profession. Um, I think that it's something that you have to work at. Uh, your career will not happen automatically. But there are many ways to do that, and there are many people who are willing to help. Uh, there are lots and lots of people who general who genuinely seek out new music, who think it's fun to hear the very latest works that are being written today. And as long as that's the case, then composing will always be a viable profession. Well, thank you so much for your, your words of advice, for spending the time speaking with me. It has been a pleasure to meet you and to get to know you a little bit better and to familiarize myself with your works, which are really lovely to listen to and to sing. So uh, thank you. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure also to get to know you and I look forward to your performance of my aria from Jane Eyre coming up. I look forward to that as well. Thank you.